Hello, this is Valdemar Janusczak, art critic, producer and presenter of documentaries. And thanks for watching Perspective, YouTube's home for classical art. I'm up here, this way. Over here! I'm up on the colonnade of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, high above the crowd, looking down on all these Catholics. Not many people are allowed up here. You know what the Vatican's like. It's been ruling the Catholics for 2,000 years, so there's no need to be nice to me but I told them what I wanted to do up here and they agreed immediately because they could see as well that this is the best place to do what I wanted to do which is to understand properly at last that great sprawling ungainly but glorious art movement the Baroque age doesn't have a nice clear outline. It sprawled across the 17th century and beyond. It wasn't a tidy movement, but it spawned some of our greatest art. The architect of this astounding square, Gian Lorenzo Bernini, was one of the key players of the Baroque. Understand Bernini and you understand the whole thing. And what he invented here in this piazza was this huge colonnade that encircles you, gathers you up. It's like a giant pair of arms. Now, 300,000 people could fit in here. That's three times more than Wembley Stadium. And every single one of them gets this big hug from Bernini's Piazza. So that's the first thing the Baroque does. It goes after you and ingratiates itself with you. Other art movements sit there on their pedestals and arrogantly assume you'll be interested in them. But the Baroque knows you better. It gets off the pedestal and hunts you down. Another of its ambitions is to impress you with its bigness, its grandeur, its drama. Would you look at the size of that? And when it fell into the hands of intense geniuses, it became dark and edgy, got all psychological on us, and blurred the divide between art and reality. And when painting wasn't enough, the Baroque roped in all the other arts to work on you as well. Architecture, sculpture, music, everything at once. It was after you, so it threw the kitchen sink at you. What we're going to do in this series is follow the Baroque from St. Peter's to St. Paul's, from Rome, where it all began, to London, where it fetched up eventually. Because another of the things that makes the Baroque special is its range. It went everywhere and basically spent 
the entire 17th century travelling about. And the really cunning thing about it is that wherever it went, it adopted the local customs and changed. And the first place we're going to visit is up here in northern Italy, in Trento. Trento in the Italian Dolomites is a pretty town which I recommend for walking holidays and mountain views. But don't let its modern tranquility fool you, because a great war started up here, a war of art. The Baroque is best understood as a fight back a marvellous display of counter-punching by a waspish church that had come out fighting. When Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis onto the church door in Wittenberg in 1517 and launched the Protestant revolt against what he called the sink of Roman sodomy, the popes, the cardinals. He wasn't just taking on the Catholic Church. Luther was taking on the whole of Italy, the entire southern Mediterranean worldview and all that goes with it. The colors, the fruitiness, the passions. In those days, Trento was in Austria, not in Italy. And it was here that the mighty Council of Trent met in 1545 to plot the fight back. A wild boar has invaded the vineyard, complained Pope Leo X memorably. The Baroque's task was to hunt that boar down and dispatch it. For nearly 20 years, the Council of Trent met here in the cathedral in Trento to plan the Catholic riposte. And art was involved from the start. The Lutherans had been against art. They saw it as a regrettable vanity that led to the worship of false idols. Terrible waves of iconoclasm had torn across northern Europe, destroying paintings, burning statues. But the Catholic Church had always believed in art. It relied on it. It knew that people like to see what they're worshipping. They like images. And that gave art tremendous power. Great profit is derived from all sacred images, declared the council. And when we kiss the sacred image and prostrate ourselves before it, we adore Christ. If anyone shall teach contrary to these decrees, concluded the council scarily, let him be anathema, anathema, anathema. Do you like the map? Baroque, of course. It was produced in Amsterdam in 1617 by Willem Blau, the finest and busiest of the Baroque map makers. Blau would later be employed by the East India Company to chart the new world that was being discovered at this time. But first, he drew Europe. See, the big capitals of Europe at the top. London, Paris, Amsterdam. And down the sides, what people were wearing in these fashionable new capitals. Look, there are the English in their silks. And over here, those Baroque heroes the poles with the feathers in their hats. 
So the Baroque fight back began up here in Trento, but its epicenter, the place where the fireworks really went off, was down south in Rome. The Eternal City had a fight on its hands. As the clock ticked over from the 16th century to the 17th, its architecture grew prouder, louder, showier, and bulged up through the Roman skyline. But, as I said, the Baroque went after you with all the arts at once. And while architecture and sculpture were frolicking in the Roman sunshine, the art form that needed the most drastic attention, painting, chose another path. The Council of Trent instructed its artists to get out there and grab people's attention. But how do you do that? One very effective trick is to make dramatic use of the dark and turn painting into theatre. That was the strategy of the Baroque's greatest revolutionary, a pictorial genius who made damn sure that the religious message of the Counter-Reformation came after you like a spotlit Rottweiler. This master of dramatic darkness was, of course, Michelangelo Merisi da Caravaggio, who deserves our sympathy as well as our admiration. Poor Caravaggio. For 300 years, he was completely forgotten, his reputation in tatters. And then the 20th century rediscovered him and began misunderstanding him in such terrible ways. What rubbish has been spouted about Caravaggio? Even sensible commentators on sensible TV channels have insisted on seeing him as a knife-mad, predatory homosexual who went berserk in Baroque Rome. The Ripper of Roma. This demonic image of Caravaggio annoys me like nothing else in the Baroque world. As if a sex-mad, out-of-control, Roman crazy could really have painted this. Thank heavens, recent research into Caravaggio has begun correcting all this nonsense, and we can start seeing him again for what he really was, the most important religious painter of the Counter-Reformation. Caravaggio did everything the Council of Trent demanded of its artists. He created a vivid new religious art that spoke to the people in a language they could effortlessly understand, a language that moved them and changed them. Before Caravaggio came along, religious art was set somewhere out there, somewhere distant and fluffy, but he made sure it took place right under your nose. Here, now, close enough to touch. The cast list changed too. Real people rounded up in taverns and markets and chosen for their characterful faces, replaced the impossible gods of old. There's that old bloke from the market and that beautiful waitress from the tavern. These are people you recognize from the streets, people you can touch and whose plight touches you. It's as if Caravaggio has set himself the task of completely reinventing religious art. And he uses every Baroque trick in the book to get your attention, 
the way this basket of fruit is about to fall over, so you want to reach in and push it back. Or the apostle's hands shoved out into your face. It's all so real, so tangible, so believable. The churches of Baroque Rome are filled with magnificent free helpings of Caravaggio. Just go in, pretend you're praying, and feel his power. Here in the church of Santa Maria del Popolo, where he began working in 1600, he pushes a horse's backside into your face, so uncouthly, and ensures you will not miss the dramatic calling of Saint Paul taking place at the horse's feet. On the other wall, Saint Peter is being crucified upside down. Did you ever see such sweaty effort, such tugging, such pulling, such pain? Look how different it all was from the usual way of spreading the religious message. Caravaggio's art was so tangible, so vivid, so cinematic, that the Roman clergy, which was used to an altogether rosier religious palette, found him a challenge. Some of his greatest paintings were rejected by the churches that had commissioned them. This one here was originally going to hang in St. Peter's, Jesus and Mary stamping on the snake of sin. Was he a little too human for them? Was she a little too sexy? Even his great death of the Virgin was rejected by the monks. Mary, they spat, looked like a bloated whore who'd been pulled out of a river. But I don't think she does. She just looks like a real woman. And in my book, Caravaggio was the best painter of convincing Marys the world of art has seen. Are they too beautiful for their own good? Maybe. Do I mind that? Not at all. While the clergy complained, the public responded and understood. Caravaggio's lesson, his darkness, his drama, seeped out of Rome and infiltrated the international Baroque at an astonishing speed. And wherever it fetched up, in Spain, in Flanders, in Holland, it transformed the local art. It's a strange name for an art movement, don't you think? Baroque. What does it mean? Where does it come from? If you think of the Renaissance, that's a very clear idea. Renaissance is French for rebirth, the rebirth of civilization. But Baroque? It actually comes from a Portuguese word, Barocco, which means a misshapen pearl, like this one. All these Portuguese explorers were setting off around the world and they were coming back with gorgeous pearls in all shapes and sizes. Now this pearl is not Baroque. This is like the Renaissance, perfectly formed, exquisite, delicate, so civilized and precious. This one, however, the Baroque pearl, is blobby, exuberant, misshapen, difficult to handle, and exciting in a deformed kind of way. So this is the Renaissance, and this is the Baroque.
nowhere was this barocco outline more obvious than in the bendy direction now taken by architecture. Rome is basically a Baroque creation. I know it's got the great ancient ruins and the fine Renaissance palaces, but the default architecture here, the stuff that gives the city its main mood, is Baroque. This beautiful little Baroque secret is a courtyard designed in the 1630s by a genius of the Roman Baroque called Borromini, Francesco Borromini. Borromini, in my opinion, was the single most exciting architect there's ever been. A genius, a man of twisted brilliance. The Picasso of architecture. This tiny courtyard he designed for the Church of San Carlo in Rome is almost gothic in its brooding intensity. I don't know if you can feel it in the film, but in the flesh you can certainly sense the solemnity, the sparse profundity of this tiny little space. And remember, architecture speaks to the body, not just the eyes. Borromini was so inventive. Can you see the balustrade up there? Look at the actual balusters, the way some of them bulge at the top and others bulge at the bottom. What for? The Renaissance would never have done something as wayward and playful as that. But Borromini was a rule breaker by instinct, and that makes him totally Baroque. So this is the cloister around which the monks would walk and read their Bibles. Now look at the church. It's like walking into a stony piece of sculpture. I've been in here scores of times. I never miss it if I'm in Rome. And I've stared and stared at this remarkable interior. But if you asked me to draw what's happening to the walls in here, I couldn't do it. It's too complicated, too fidgety, too inventive. But what I can do is to try and draw a plan of the building, because it's completely crazy. What Borromini is trying to do here is to blend two completely different shapes. Out here, there's a kind of blunt Greek cross. So a Greek cross with the ends taken off. But in the middle, all that becomes a perfect oval. So this, is the edge of the church, all this seemingly chaotic going in and out. But underlying it, as you can see, is this perfect bit of geometry made up of rectangles, made up of triangles, and these circles here. And that's what Borromini always does. He builds this exact mathematical basis and then he just ruffles it up like someone messing up your hair. Well, 
I've seen geometry as madly busy as that on the great domes of Islam, but never in a Christian church. Borromini supplied Baroque architecture with something dark and emotional. It's feminine principle, it's yin. But every yin, of course, needs a yang. And in Baroque Rome, the undisputed king of yang was Gian Lorenzo Bernini. The great Bernini was everything that Borromini wasn't. Handsome, rich, haughty, a smooth operator who charmed the kings and the popes. As architect, as sculptor, as painter, the man could do everything. And the raw spirit of the Baroque coursed through his veins as fiercely as the water spouting from one of his fountains. Where Borromini was almost certainly homosexual, and he died this terrible death, he committed suicide, threw himself on his sword and took a long time to die. Bernini was a ladies' man, through and through, and Bernini would never have dreamt of killing himself because that would have deprived the world of his flamboyant genius. San Andrea al Quirinale by Bernini. It's just a couple of hundred feet up the road from Borromini's San Carlo, but it seems to come from a different architectural planet. Borromini invented the curved church facade that bends the front of the church out into the street. But Bernini, he got really good at it too. And then out here, another curve going the other way. And that's the Baroque for you. It twists this way and that, always on the move, like a restless dragonfly. Walking into Bernini San Andrea is like walking into a piece of theater. Bernini fills his church with rich color. Look at that lantern up there, that golden lantern. You put yellow glass up there, so when the sun shines, it's as if the whole interior is being flooded with this gorgeous, golden, divine light. Bernini's church has this very specific storyline for you to notice and follow. So St. Andrew, the patron of the church, is being martyred here. He's heading up towards heaven there. And right at the very top, in the lantern, he's being welcomed into heaven. The little cherubs are even standing aside to make room for him so he can go up there. It's a very theatrical effect, very different from anything Borromini ever tried to do. The Baroque had a taste for theatricality. That's why it liked Bernini so much. And if you want to witness some truly stupendous Baroque theatre, then follow me into St. Peter's. An extraordinary creation in front of us is Bernini's Baldacchino, put up under the transept between 1624 and 1633. 
Now you have a good look at it, you tell me. Is that sculpture, or is it architecture? Or is it a combination of the two, so it doesn't really matter? I go for the last option. That's what you get with a Baroque. All the dividing lines get blurred. Santa Maria della Vittoria, which many people consider to be Bernini's masterpiece, including Bernini. It shows the Spanish saint, Saint Teresa of Avila, at a moment when she's having a vision. An angel has come down to her from heaven and he's piercing her heart with a flaming arrow. So real was the pain to me that I moaned out loud several times. And yet, it was so indescribably sweet that I could not wish to be released from it. When the angel withdrew his spear, I was left with a great love of God. What he's done here is create theatre in the church. On either side, in, sitting in these boxes, is the family that commissioned the Cornaro Chapel, the Cornaro family. Up there on the right, with the little beard, looks a little bit like Shakespeare. That's Federico Cornaro. He's the one who actually paid for it all. So the Cornaro family has gathered to witness this miraculous event at the centre. The other thing that people always pick up on about this work is this look on St. Teresa's face. This open-mouthed, moaning look. Now, what Bernini is trying to do here is to find some sculptural form for this religious ecstasy that she's feeling. But the 20th century in particular has misinterpreted that look on her face. All sorts of smutty remarks have been made about her ecstasy. What kind of ecstasy is it? Wink, wink. I really disagree with all of that. Imagine trying to find a sculptural form for something as difficult as a young woman being overpowered by the love of God. How do you convey that? What do you show? Well, I'll tell you the answer. That's what you do. This is art dazzling you with miracles. In Bernini's hands, stone comes alive and stops behaving like stone. He could turn rock into flesh and women into trees. His work is filled with movement and restless transformation. The Cornaro Chapel is a fusion of sculpture, painting, marbling, gilding. Even the real light of God has been roped into achieving this great Baroque effect. If you're investigating the Baroque, this is a position I recommend, because from here, you can see the Baroque properly. The Baroque loved painted ceilings, filling the air above you and around you with remarkable sights was a very Baroque ambition. 
course, painted ceilings had existed in Italian art for centuries. The Sistine Chapel was just the best known example. But they're difficult to do. The Baroque, however, was never afraid of effort. Whatever it took, whatever it cost, the Baroque was up for it. And it developed such a fierce appetite for the painted ceiling. When the art is all around you and above you, it creates this other world into which you've stepped, a new reality. Think of it, perhaps, as a kind of 17th century virtual reality, because these painted ceilings blur the divide between the art and you. This is the first great painted room of the Baroque age. These days, it's the French Embassy in Rome, and they've kindly let us in because the French are such fine people. But back in the Baroque age, this fine palace belonged to Cardinal Eduardo Farnese, one of the most powerful clerics in Rome. And in 1597, at the very dawn of the Baroque era, Farnese commissioned a young painter from Bologna, Anibale Caracci, to come to Rome with his brothers, who were also artists, and to paint this. Cardinal Eduardo Farnese should have been a man of God, and perhaps in his public life he was. But in his private life, back here in his palace, he seems to have unleashed his sinful side. And what he commissioned Anibale Caracci to paint in the Piano Nobile of the Farnese Palace is a room filled with stories about the mad love affairs of the gods. Wherever you turn in here, pagan gods are loving other gods in a divine orgy of love and conflict and role-playing and naughtiness. Karachi has somehow managed to celebrate 20 different divine love affairs simultaneously on this one ceiling. And to do that, he's employed a cunning optical trick. Each of the love affairs is taking place inside its own picture. And all these pictures have been crammed onto the roof where they're held wonkily in place by a busy assortment of cupids and nudes and statues. And then it gets even more complicated because all these cherubs refuse to stay outside the action. So they get involved. Sometimes they're inside the picture, other times they're outside the picture. Time and space are being played with by a master scenographer. They're being pulled out of the true in this glorious jumble of realities. This room was to be hugely influential. And what the Karachi invented here was to become one of the main ingredients of the Baroque. We dart about in this series, going here and there, with me telling you this and that, trying to grasp the Baroque. But to be honest, there's a much easier way. All you have to do to understand the Baroque fully and perfectly is to come in here and look up at that. That is the Baroque. We're 
in the Jesuit church of San Ignacio. It was built to celebrate the canonization of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. That's him up there on the cloud. In 1626, Pope Gregory XV officially made Ignatius a saint. And all this could begin. The Jesuits liked to keep things in-house, kept down the costs, and ensured that the opinions being expressed by the artist were Jesuit opinions. So for this church, they got in a Jesuit lay brother from Trento, Padre Pozzo. Pozzo was a master of illusion. He was the best there's ever been at making small spaces look huge. His influential book on achieving these amazing optical illusions was read by everybody through the ages. They even say that Cecil B. DeMille consulted it when planning his biggest cinema moments. Because Padre Pozzo was a wonderful movie maker, born 300 years early. Pozzo's first work in here was this dark, illusionistic dome, which, unlike a real dome, was cheap and easy to repair. You just got someone in and repainted it. The little dome was so convincing, the Jesuits decided to unleash Pozzo on the rest of the church. All that is basically a flat roof. The entire sky has been painted. Every cloud, every architrave, every column. What Pozzo's done here is to use his Baroque magic to open up the roof and create this stupendous shortcut to heaven. And right in the middle, floating up on a cloud, is Saint Ignatius himself. He's going up to heaven where Jesus is waiting to greet him. And see that glorious light emanating from the wound in Jesus' side? That's the light of divine revelation, pouring out of Jesus and into Saint Ignatius. And then it's being scattered further to the four corners of the earth. To Asia with that rather wonky camel. To Africa with what I suppose must be a crocodile. Europe, rather tame in comparison, and America, where a bare-chested Red Indian Amazon looks down at a roaring cougar. All these were places that the Jesuits had their missions. It's what my daughter might call a rather cheesy bit of Jesuit propaganda. But what fantastic theatre, what ambition, what scale, what excitement. There's something in here I want to show you. It's a little Baroque gem, a secret. It's more work by Padre Pozzo. So it's a kind of illusionistic colonnade, all painted by Pozzo, showing the story of the life of St. Ignatius, because we're in the Jesuit college deep inside somewhere. I'm not sure exactly which bit of it. Now, what's amazing about this is that you can get really close to the Pozzo painting and see how it's done. For example, can you see the two figures over there holding up an urn on the left? Right, I'll go and point it out to you. Stay there, stay there. 
these two figures here. Come over here. Look at that. That's how wide they have to be. So all of these figures, all the architecture, has been corrected. So that it only looks right from one place. Like all of Pozzo's work, you have to stand on a particular spot for it to look good. Someone asked Pozzo about that once. They said, what's the point of doing one of these things when you can only see it from one place? That means only one person at a time can see it properly. And he said, ah, that's their problem. My job is to paint it. Their job is to understand it. So here in Rome, a revolution had been launched. Painting had been reinvented. Sculpture transformed. Architecture revolutionized. And it was time for the Baroque to spread its wings. Soon enough, it would arrive on the doorstep of most of the known world and become the first truly global art movement. But first, there was the rest of Italy to conquer. Down here in Naples, for instance, all sorts of Baroque darknesses were stirring. I don't want to go down there. I'm scared. But the story of the Baroque leaves me no option. There's a book that's very popular now. I'm sure you've heard of it. A Thousand Places to See Before You Die by Patricia Schultz. Naples isn't in it, but it should be because that title about seeing places before you die is taken from a line by Goethe. See Naples and die, wrote Goethe ambiguously in the 18th century after he'd spent some time here. But what exactly did he mean? Is he saying that Naples is so beautiful that once you've seen it, you'll die happy? Or is he saying that Naples is so dangerous that if you come here, the chances are you'll end up dead? In Caravaggio's day, this was the second biggest city in Europe after Paris. Half a million people were squashed into Naples, most of them out of work and living in slums. One in ten of the inhabitants were some sort of cleric, a priest, a nun. So religion and wickedness had carved up Naples between them, and the two of them were operating here in tandem. Caravaggio turned up in Naples in 1606. He'd gotten into an argument in Rome over a tennis match and murdered his opponent. Now he was on the run. At that time, Naples was a Spanish colony, separate from the rest of Italy. So all sorts of ruffians, thieves, murderers and good-for-nothings turned up here, fleeing from the Italian authorities. Caravaggio's reputation got to Naples before he did. And he was soon at work here at his usual breakneck speed, painting some of his greatest pictures. The moment he reached Naples, his art seemed to grow darker. Rome may be where the Baroque was born, but Naples was where it learned to scream and howl. Signora, buongiorno. This is the Piemonte di Misericordia. It's the home church. 
of another of these strange little confraternities that were so busy in the Baroque. The Misericordianists dispensed charity to the poor, so, as you can imagine, they were very busy in Naples. Caravaggio painted this soon after he arrived. He was only in Naples for less than a year, but see what he achieved. There's a school of thought which believes that this picture, The Seven Acts of Mercy, is the greatest religious painting of the 17th century. And I'm not about to disagree. We're on a street corner in Naples. There's a prison on the right. And over here, out of sight, there's a tavern. The original idea was to paint each of the seven acts of mercy in a separate altarpiece in the chapel. Caravaggio has combined all of them in one picture. Now you'll be thinking, what the hell are the seven acts of mercy? Good question. Basically, they're seven human kindnesses that you can and should perform for your fellows. And I'm sure that you do. First, you have to bury the dead. And that's going on here, see? There's the little feet of a fresh corpse being carried away. Another act of mercy is to clothe the naked. And Saint Martin here has cut his cloak in half and presents it to a naked beggar. You also have to help the sick and the infirm. And that's going on down here too because the naked beggar is also a lowly cripple, pulling himself along on the ground. You also have to visit those in prison, as she's doing over here. And you're meant to feed the hungry as well. And this kindly daughter is giving suck to her own imprisoned father. It's a startling sight. The charitable are supposed to offer shelter to pilgrims. He's a pilgrim, you can tell from the shell in his hat. So the innkeeper here is offering him a room for the night. Finally, the thirsty must be given something to drink. So Samson, in the gloom, is gulping down the contents of an ass's jaw. So there you have it, seven acts of mercy, all recorded in one Baroque tornado of a composition. Caravaggio wasn't the only lawbreaker to seek refuge in Naples. There were many others, including a Spanish painter and Caravaggio worshipper called Giuseppe Ribera, or as the locals called him, La Spagnoletto the little Spaniard. This little Spaniard, Ribera, was a quarrelsome devil. He came to Naples to flee his creditors in Rome. And because Naples was under Spanish control then, Ribera had his pick of rich Spanish clients. For most of his career, he painted in the Caravaggio manner, dark, brooding religious art, sweaty and guilty. But his Spanish roots began to show soon enough, and his taste for the macabre was legendary. This is Ribera's infamous bearded woman, whom he painted more than once. Ribera liked bearded women. And this deceptively cheerful, smiling boy is actually a cripple with a club foot. When you notice his deformity, 
the smile on his face takes on a different meaning. Ribera was the main mover in a nasty little organization, a kind of mini mafia called the Cabal of Naples. He got together with two other local miscreants, a vicious Greek called Correnzio, and a fine Neapolitan painter, Caracciolo, who deserves a much better reputation than he's got. Because Caracciolo painted some magnificently dark Neapolitan pictures. So these three, Ribera, Correnzio, and Caracciolo, began beating up and murdering all their rivals. If you were a foreign painter taking business away from the Cabal of Naples, you'd better beware. The Cabal was particularly cruel to the followers of Annibale Caracci. Domenichino came here to paint a fresco, and every morning the Cabal would remove what he'd done the day before. And then they put sand in his paint. Domenichino died in Naples, poisoned, they say, by the Cabal. Poor old Guido Reni had an even worse time. The Cabal hired an assassin to murder him. And this assassin made a mistake and killed one of Rennie's assistants instead. And Rennie fled the city, never to return. So one of his pupils was sent down here to finish the commission. And this pupil was lured onto a boat in the Bay of Naples and never heard from again. The Cabal of Naples was wound up in 1641, but its work was done. The cheerful side of the Baroque had been kept out of Naples. By the time the Cabal was done with it, the Baroque had forgotten many of its good intentions. Darkness, violence, murder, horror, those were Naples' black gifts to the Baroque and particularly to Spain, where our journey continues in the next film, and where the Baroque was taken to such passionate extremes. film, we are over here in Italy watching the birth of the Baroque and we ended up in Naples, down here. Naples was a Spanish colony and that means the next stage of our journey is over here in Spain. Oh my God! <laughs> Thank you.
One of the chief reasons why the Baroque was as successful as it was, why it became the first global art movement, was because it was so damn adaptable. The Baroque spread across Europe like a wildfire. And everywhere it went, it adopted the local tastes and customs and sneakily made itself at home. But when it got here, to Spain, it didn't have that much adapting to do. The Spanish were already fiercely Catholic. They liked drama, emotion, passion, darkness. They were, if you like, instinctively Baroque. So the Baroque's task here in Spain wasn't really a case of adaptation. It was more like pouring petrol on a large bonfire. The Spanish Baroque was hardcore, the most fiercely Catholic the Baroque became. Some of its sights will turn your stomach and appall you. But the Baroque was a war, remember, a battle for your heart, deliberately started by the Counter-Reformation. And in times of war, anything goes. This is the longest pilgrim trail in Spain, the southern route to Santiago de Campostello. It's called the Via de la Plata, the Silver Road. And I'm going to be walking some of it for you because it takes you past so many key Baroque sites. But the first stop I want to make is that lovely tower shimmering on the horizon. Seville, the start of the Via de la Plata. This is a cultural hotspot, if ever there was one. The old Jewish quarter in Seville. Can you feel the cultural potency bubbling up in this place? Ooh. This is where Rossini's famous opera, The Barber of Seville, is set, and also Mozart's Marriage of Figaro. A bit further out is the Baroque Tobacco Factory, in which that dangerous beauty, Carmen, worked in Bizet's opera. What a grand building for a tobacco factory. What a perfect building for an opera. Now, all this is pertinent because, remember, opera is a Baroque invention. And fusing the arts together like this, music and theatre, dance and spectacle, was a very Baroque thing to do. But that's not why I've brought you here. I wanted to show you where Diego Velázquez was born, in that modest house over there, in Seville's Jewish Quarter, in 1599. Velázquez, Spain's greatest Baroque artist, would later pass himself off as a man of aristocratic bearing. What a haughty presence he affected in his own art. Official painter to the Spanish king, the dark dignitary, the maestro with the perfect moustache. But some energetic researchers have recently been digging up Velázquez's past 
and it's been discovered that he was in fact of Jewish origin. His family on his father's side were Portuguese Jews who'd converted to Christianity, what they call around here conversos. So Velázquez, the son of a converso, could almost be called the first Jewish artist. important paintings that Velázquez produced weren't portrayals of kings or Venuses or popes, but humble and very realistic depictions of ordinary life. They were called bodegons after the Spanish word bodegon, which means a tavern or eating house. The young Velázquez painted a clutch of these bodegones. They're brilliant things, so atmospheric and tactile. You can hear the eggs sizzling. You can smell the garlic being crushed. The Brock's fascination with lowlife, bars, taverns, kitchens amounted to an obsession and it shouldn't really surprise us. Remember, one of the chief aims of the Counter-Reformation was to address the hearts and the minds of ordinary people. So art was encouraged to talk their language and to set its action in their spaces. The Bodegones have a deeper meaning. Realism for realism's sake was never Velázquez's only ambition. He was much too Baroque for that. Realism's job in his art is to hook you and pull you in closer till you're close enough to see the painting's real meaning. Look into the background of the great kitchen scene in the house of Martha and Mary, and you'll see that Jesus got here before you. According to the Bible, Jesus came to visit the two sisters, Martha and Mary. And while Martha busied herself in the kitchen, Mary sat at Jesus' feet and listened to his word. When Martha complained that her sister wasn't helping out, Jesus stopped her. Mary, he replied, has chosen to listen. And in the end, listening to the word is more important than preparing the dinner. It's that Baroque message again. Life is short. Reality is an illusion. And only the word of God lasts forever. Velázquez was so strikingly talented that when he was 23, he was summoned to Madrid by the king himself, Philip IV, and told to paint the royal portrait. So he left Seville and never really came back. But his new employers were about to discover a splendid Baroque rule. You can take a genius out of the bodega, yes, but you can't take the bodega out of a genius. The Spanish kings, the dreaded Habsburgs, were a spectacularly awful bunch. Dim-witted, arrogant, pious, deformed, but God, in his wisdom, saw something he liked about them and gave them most of the known world to rule. 
a gigantic international empire of three billion acres spreading from Italy to the Netherlands, from Africa to the Americas. But to rule, you need rulers, and that's where it had got tricky. Their problem was the usual royal problem of inbreeding. To keep the money and the titles in the family, the Habsburgs had spent too many generations marrying amongst themselves. Cousins, uncles, nephews, nieces. Even as great a portraitist as Velázquez had trouble telling apart the Habsburg princesses. This one is Philip IV's wife, as well as his niece. She was going to marry his son, but the son died young, so she married the dad instead. This one is Philip's daughter. And this one... Oh, I give up. You need a degree in forensics to tell them apart. Their most obvious physical deformity was their lower lip, the infamous Habsburg lip, which stuck out at an angle like that. A genetic condition called mandibular prognathism. They almost all had it. And that's why that old wives' tale does the rounds about why the Spanish lisp. It's because none of their royals could actually say gracias. They could only say gracias. But even royal inbreeding, as scary as this, can occasionally throw up an interesting variation. And Philip IV, who was king here in Spain for the key Baroque years, 1621 to 1665, was a serious and thoughtful monarch. 44 years he ruled, and it's said that in all that time he only laughed at court on three occasions. Philip had the lip and that pushed-in Habsburg face, as concave as a Baroque church facade, but he liked the arts and was sensitive to them. Like all the Habsburgs, Philip IV didn't do much that was right. But in choosing Velázquez as his court painter, he can at least be credited with one remarkable decision. Velázquez brought us closer to the Spanish kings than any audience had previously been to its royals. And from this close-up, you get to see, surprise, surprise, that they're just like the rest of us. Flawed, worried, wrinkly. When the time came to paint his most ambitious offering in the field of royal portraiture, Velázquez adopted the usual Baroque strategy of going big. But everything else he tried here was new and revolutionary, and it lifted the genre to its greatest heights. Las Meninas, The Maids. Velázquez's masterpiece. Set inside the royal palace, it's a group shot of the royal court, and many people will tell you it's the greatest Baroque painting of them all. It was painted in 1656, near the end of Velázquez's life. Now, the reason why this picture confuses people so much, I think, is because there is such a huge cast list involved. When you first look at it, you think, oh, what's going on? Who are all these people? So, as a helpful guide to Las Meninas, I'm just going to introduce them all to you. The key figures, of course, are Velázquez himself on the left. He's painting away. In the middle, the Infanta Margarita. She's the five-year-old daughter of the Spanish king, Philip IV, and his wife, Princess Mariana of Austria. And there in the picture too, reflected at the back, in the mirror at the back of the studio. Now everybody else who looks after the little princess is also in the foreground. These are her two dwarfs on the right, 
female dwarf from Germany, Maria Balova, famous dwarf at the court, Italian dwarf on the right, putting a foot on the princess's great big dog, the royal mastiff, playfully giving it a kick in the back. And behind the princess, you see the two shadowy figures. The woman on the left, she's the princess's chaperone. And the figure on the right, that's the princess's bodyguard. So right at the front of the picture, you've got all the people who look after the princess, princess herself and Velasquez, painting busily away. Velasquez shows himself looking like a member of the royal household himself. Look how haughtily he stands with that excellent moustache. And he's at work on this huge canvas on the left. What is he actually painting? I think that only makes sense when you work out what's actually going on in this picture. The king and the queen are actually standing out here where the audience is now looking at the picture afresh. So Velasquez is painting the king and the queen who are standing over here. And the king and the queen can see themselves in the mirror, perhaps to check how they look, but also because of this beautiful game of psychological trickery that's going on here, they seem to be looking out at us at the same time. But what's this picture really about? Who is the focus of all this action and all this psychological toing and froing? It has to be the Infanta herself. This sweet little princess right at the middle of the picture. And because the Habsburgs had this terrible history of inbreeding, they had nothing but bad luck in the production of children. And although Philip and Mariana had five babies, at the time this picture was painted, only one of them was alive, the Infanta Margarita. The princess with her blonde hair and her gorgeous white silk dress is like an angel of deliverance at the center of this black and doomy and intense and psychologically troubling group portrait. She represents all their hopes for the future. There were only two possible sources of a commission in Baroque Spain. You either worked for the kings or you worked for the monks. The Habsburgs had baroquely discovered the power of art but the real rulers of Spain had always known it. I'm afraid I've got some bad news for you. If you want to understand the Spanish Baroque reasonably well, better than all those around you, then you need to brush up on your religious orders. I know it's not very 21st century, but if you can't tell the difference between the Franciscans and the Dominicans, or the Mercedarians and the Carthusians, then so much of what's going on in so many amazing Spanish Baroque paintings will go over your head. Why, for instance, is he upside down? Why is he writing on himself in blood? Why are they nodding off? And why is he staring so darkly at that? To help you out, I've prepared a handy pilgrim's guide to the Spanish religious orders. You'll thank me for this. This one here, he's a Franciscan. Brown robes, knotted cord for a belt. Franciscan. Sometimes the clothes get more ragged and patched, but they're still Franciscans. He, on the other hand, is a Dominican. Black cow, white robe, Dominican quite often seen in the Americas, 
converting the Indians, or sometimes whipping off their robes and flagellating themselves. Dominicans. The ones in the black robes are Benedictines. Remember, black robes, Benedictines. They don't appear in art as often as the others. They're the moody, silent ones. So did you get all that? Franciscans, brown. Dominicans, black and white. Benedictines, all black. Now, you're ready for the Spanish Baroque. Now you're ready for Francisco de Zurbaran, Spain's spookiest Baroque artist. He was born here in Fuente de Cantos, the fifth stop on the Via de la Plata. So his understandings were small town understandings, and his rhythms were the rhythms of the pilgrimage. These days, Zurbaran is reasonably well known, but at the start of the 20th century, he was completely obscure. In fact, most Spanish art, apart from Velázquez, was underexplored and undervalued. I think it was so dark, so strange, so Catholic, that we just didn't get it. And in particular, we didn't get Zorbaran. These are, let's face it, bizarre and unsettling images. Uncomfortable funerals. Impossible deaths. The Zorbaran family house on the main square in Fuente de Cantos. It's quite a posh house now. It must have been really posh in the 17th century. Zorbran's father was a prosperous textile merchant from the north, the Basque country, who moved down here because southern Spain, particularly Andalusia, was experiencing this boom in new religious building. And there was so much money here for the priests and their new outfits. So there's a lot of work for the Zorbarans. Many years later, Francisco de Zorbaran painted a mysterious series of Christian martyrs, beautiful female martyrs, all of whom were dressed in modern clothes. They're some of the most beautifully painted and exciting clothes in 17th century Baroque art. And people said that Zorbran was using his father's textiles in these paintings, advertising them, using these Christian martyrs just to show off what his dad had for sale. Zurbaran's main employers were the Spanish religious orders, the Mercedarians, the Carthusians, the Benedictines, the Dominicans, and the Franciscans. One day, Pope Nicholas V visited Assisi. He wanted to see the crypt where St. Francis was buried. And at five in the morning, he went down into the crypt with a band of monks. And all they had with them was torches. And as the torchlight spread around the dark crypt, suddenly they saw St. Francis standing there, 200 years after his death, still as fresh as if he'd just stepped out of a bath, untouched unblemished, as if time hadn't touched him. Zorbaran went on to do many other things, but monks were his speciality. Monks were where his genius was best expressed. 
And it's not just the vividness with which he illustrated their uncanny stories, but that sense you get with him that Zorbaran's monks are so convincingly full of God, full of worship, full of thought. No painter has painted human belief as convincingly as this. The Baroque pilgrim, trudging dutifully the 600 miles from Seville to Santiago de Compostela, would have had regular encounters with the Spanish Baroque. And waiting for them at the end of the trudge was an eye-catching eruption of Baroque architecture. You know, Chaucer's wife of Bath came on the pilgrimage to Santiago. It's been the most famous pilgrimage route in Europe for a thousand years. But it was the Baroque era that shaped the town itself and gave Santiago de Compostela its memorable and exciting look. The cathedral here, to which thousands of busy pilgrims scuttle daily, is a Baroque wedding cake in the churigiresque style, which, as far as I can tell, consists chiefly of adding things to places when there isn't really room for them. But somewhere within this crazily writhing, sculpture-encrusted fantasy facade, methinks me sees the remnants of Spain's Islamic past. Inside the great pilgrimage church at Santiago, the Baroque's love of glitter has been spectacularly unleashed. Guilt may have driven the Spanish Baroque, but gold was what paid for it. The stupendous wealth of the American colonies was flooding into Spain, and then into the pockets of the Catholic Church, which spent it as the Catholic Church so often did on art. You know, there's never been an art movement as adept as the Baroque was at absorbing local influences, taking them all in, regurgitating them, and then spitting them out at the other end as something that looks unmistakably Baroque. You can't imagine this building in Italy, or France, or, perish the thought, England. It's obviously from around here, but with all that thrusting and swirling and movement, it's just as obviously Baroque. But there is one huge slab of the world where you can easily imagine this. When I say the Baroque was the first truly international art movement, I mean truly international. The Churigaresque style may not have travelled to Italy or France, but it travelled all right to the far, far corners of the Spanish Empire, where it ended up in some very remote places. Wherever the monks went, the Baroque went. And it ended up as the house style of the whole of Latin America.
but not all of the Baroque's travels were quite so exotic. How the Spanish kings came to own Belgium is a dark political story involving so many battles and so much constant religious conflict that we'd be here for as long as the Hundred Years' War trying to understand it fully. Let's just say they were here and they shouldn't have been. In any case, what interests us is the art that came out of the Spanish Netherlands. And for that, you need a strong stomach. The Spanish were here for nearly 200 years, but you'd hardly know it. There's so little sign of them left. A few plaques, some statues, and this magnificent Baroque square in the center of Brussels, the Grotta Market. It's as action-packed a square as the Baroque ever produced with its ring of spiky and busy Baroque buildings. The Grotta Market is a 50-course banquet of architecture in which all the courses are served up at once. Superb building at the end, the House of the Fox. That used to be the headquarters of the Haberdashers Guild. Next to it, the Guild of the Boatmen, their centre was in the house of the horn. See the big gold horn there. But the most interesting for us is the one at the end. See there? That used to be the headquarters of the Baker's Guilds. It's now a pub called the King of Spain. And right on top, a statue of Charles II. Even by the standards of the Habsburgs, Charles was a terrible advertisement for royalty. All those generations of Habsburg inbreeding had turned him into an imbecile. The only surviving son of Philip IV, he couldn't walk or talk till he was seven. And an aging nurse breastfed him till he reached puberty. Too weak to survive an education, he grew up illiterate and squalid. So they made him King of the Netherlands and named this pub after him. It was a monumental clash of cultures. The Spanish with their black, intense, morbid gloominess and the fun-loving Flemish with their naughty, juicy, fleshy lust for life we're never going to see eye to eye, but somehow the coming together of these two momentous opposites squeezed so much monumental art into the world. I probably don't need to tell you who the best known representative was of the Flemish tendency. His notoriety goes before him. He's one of those artists who seems to have nothing much to say to the modern world. So our times have taken a dislike to him, but not me. I've got all the time in the world for Peter Paul Rubens. Rubens shouldn't be out of fashion. An artist as great as him, should never be out of fashion. This was one of the towering geniuses of art. A serial achiever on so many Baroque fronts. For instance, he designed that. And this tower here. And 
already painted that. But he's notorious, of course, for his love of fat women. The adjective Rubenesque has entered our language to describe the Dawn French type. The big un, the size 16er. And there's no point denying Rubens liked the fuller figure. Rubens' art bulges at the seams with a huge tonnage of happily wobbling cellulite. The bigger woman rang his bell and squeezed his pips. But he wasn't alone in that. That's how the Flemish like their women. Rubens' career coincided neatly with that rare thing in Flanders some decent Spanish leadership. In fact, there were two governors overseeing the Spanish Netherlands in tandem, the conjoined married pair of archdukes, Albert over here and Isabella. Albert and Isabella ruled here from 1598 to 1621. She was Philip II's daughter. He was the same king's nephew. So they were actually Habsburg cousins and should never have married. But when Philip II made them the joint governors of the Spanish Netherlands, Albert and Isabella surprised everyone by being rather good at ruling the Belgians. And their arrival put a stop, temporarily at least, to the constant round of Flemish warfare. And it was in this period of peace and prosperity that Rubens began to operate. Rubens, interestingly, had been born a Protestant. His father was a Flemish convert to Calvinism. But when the father died, the family converted back to Catholicism. And you'd never guess from Rubens' Catholic handiwork that he'd ever been away from the faith. This stupendous masterclass in Baroque movement and emotion, the descent from the cross in Antwerp Cathedral, is Rubens' greatest moment as a creator of thunderous religious theatre. If this doesn't move you, you've got no soul. The young Rubens unleashed sex and violence on us too in this scary Baroque manner. It's hard to believe what's going on here. And my God, Will you look at that? But let's not be hypocritical about these dark and tremendous action pictures. Judging by the stuff that pours out of our cinemas today, a taste for this has always been in us. Rubens was merely early in admitting it. If you know Rubens only for his naked orgies and his show-off mythologies, you might be surprised to discover that he had a quiet side, a lovely, gentle aspect. Rubens couldn't stop painting. He was a tap that couldn't be turned off. It was habitual for him, a necessity. So when the King of Spain wasn't commissioning him, Rubens painted something much closer to hand instead. His family, just for himself, just for the pleasure of it. And the 
His first wife, the charismatic and eager-eyed Isabella Brandt, had died tragically young in 1626. Rubens was devastated. He'd put so much love into painting the two of them, sitting there in their Sunday best, two cooing lovebirds in a bower. But it was his second wife, Hélène Formont, who played the largest part in his art. He married her when he was 53. She was only 16. She's that fleshy, blonde nude who appears in so many of his mythologies. The best model ever for the Rubens girl. You can definitely tell from his art how much he wanted her. The many portrayals of Hélène Formont sizzle with lust. The joyous lust of a 53-year-old man who's hit lucky with a beautiful 16-year-old girl. It doesn't sound good, I grant you, but he loved her and he wanted her and it shows. Never before in art have we been granted this much access to the private life of a celebrity artist. 400 years before Hello! magazine, Rubens had already realised that the world was now fascinated by everything he did. That's how ahead of the times he was. That's how Baroque he was. Rubens spoke six languages fluently, and he moved easily among kings and popes. He was the consummate schmoozer. So, in 1629, the Spanish king sent him to England to schmooze Charles I, which Rubens successfully did. So Charles knighted him and the University of Cambridge made Sir Peter Paul Rubens a master of arts. Soon enough, the Baroque would follow Rubens to England. But first, there were still lands to conquer closer to home, just a border away to the north. Welcome to Holland, the wettest stage in the Baroque's great journey from Rome to London, from St. Peter's to St. Paul's. So far in this series, we've been investigating the Catholics. They invented the Baroque. It was their movement, their mindset. It reflected their passions, their hopes, their fears. But, as any mother will tell you, babies don't always grow up as you expect them to. And that was definitely true of the Baroque. By the time it got here, to Holland, it was much too big and boisterous an art movement to be controlled by one religion or one mindset. Indeed, one of the most remarkable things about the Baroque is how brilliantly, how confidently and inventively it switched its allegiance from the Catholics to the Protestants. The greatest Dutch painter of them all, Rembrandt, was a classic Baroque hero. Intense, dramatic and ambiguous.
Rembrandt was born a Protestant here in Leiden, a fierce Calvinist stronghold on the edge of Holland. But to make it, he had to leave Leiden and move here to Amsterdam, where he turned very Baroque and quickly made his mark. All that's actually happening in Rembrandt's tumultuous night watch is that a company of home guards, a Dutch dad's army, is setting out on its daily march around the town. But the sense of occasion here, the emotion, the movement, the drama, is so big and so baroque, you'd think they were off to save the world. Leiden may have been a Calvinist stronghold, but Rembrandt's mother actually came from an old Catholic family. And to my eyes, he inherited a popish intensity from her, a Catholic fretfulness and sweatiness that gives all of his art its biblical air. Rembrandt couldn't keep out of his own art. This intense little man from Leiden took such a shine to his own face. He kept painting it and repainting it, more often than any artist had ever done before him. In 1635, he showed himself flush with Amsterdam's success, celebrating his early good times with his beloved wife, Saskia. But even here, there's doubt in the air. Rembrandt's self-portraits lead you on a merry goose chase as they peep in and out of his soul. I'm particularly fond of this mysterious bit of method acting painted near the end of his life. The self-portrait with circles. Why is he standing there with two big circles painted on the wall behind him? There have been lots of interpretations, but the one that convinces me involves an old story that was told about Phidias, the greatest painter of classical times. Phidias was famous for being able to draw a perfect circle freehand without a compass. And Rembrandt, in his ageing self-portrait with circles, is surely saying, I can do that too. But he's not saying it with great conviction, is he? Because there's always so much doubt in Rembrandt. So much hesitation. A sadness that draws you towards his irresistible vulnerability, like a magnet. And this realisation that the problems of an artist, his insecurities and inner life were worthy of a picture, was one of the Baroque's most brilliant insights. It was the first art movement to realise that people are as interested in weakness as they are in strength, that doubts are as compelling as achievements, and that the real hero is sometimes the underdog. Protestant Holland put the ordinary doubts of ordinary people at the centre of art. You didn't have to be a pope or a king or a mythological hero to deserve your place in art. Everybody deserved their place in art. You see that chap up there, second from the left at the top, right at the back of this busy crowd scene. Do you know who that is? He's a personal hero of mine, one of the great geniuses of the Dutch Baroque, an artist blessed with some of the fastest hands in art. That 
is Franz House. Franz House is perhaps best known for painting this smirking chappy, known to us all as the Laughing Cavalier. In fact, he isn't laughing and he isn't a cavalier. He's an unknown Dutch bravo, exuding such excellent nonchalance. These chaps here were all members of another of these Dad's Army Brigades, a squad of amateur soldiers from Harlem called the Civic Guard of St. George. In theory, they were there to protect the city in times of war. In practice, they met a few times a month and socialized energetically. This is their end of term photograph in which everyone in the class poses for a picture. These things are really tricky to paint. With a king or a pope, you just put them in the center of the picture and that's that. But the Protestant democratization of art caused all sorts of compositional problems. Here you have 15 people, all of whom have paid to appear in this picture and all of whom expect to be seen properly. House was a genius at getting that right. Look how skillfully he arranges them around the table, turning this way and that. A couple at the front, some at the back. It's a magnificent piece of human orchestration and it creates that restless sense of movement, of the action swirling about the picture that is so quintessentially Baroque. And there's something else, something even more Baroque than all this restlessness. These men are meant to be soldiers, but you never see them fighting. They're meant to be civic heroes, but there's no aggression in their eyes. The St. George Civic Guard of which House himself was a member, is instead always shown banqueting and chatting and bonding. That's because these showy banqueting scenes are actually subtle pieces of Baroque propaganda for peace. Holland had seen so many wars and squabbles and wished so desperately for them to end. But instead of coming out with that in some aggressive propagandist way, House implies it subtly, sneakily, baroquely. God's great bounty should not be squandered on war and conflict. This subliminal moralizing became the chief obsession of the Dutch Baroque. You can't trust any of this art to mean what it seems to mean. Especially not when it's been painted by that elusive Dutch genius who smuggled the most subtle subliminal messages into his pictures. Jan Vermeer of Delft. I'm like everyone else. I love Vermeer. Those frugal and tearful women of his, lost in their own thoughts, trying to read a love letter as the weak light of Delft struggles through their window. They claw at my masculine attention. I can't resist them. But Vermeer is as much of a moralist as the rest of them. His beautiful and thoughtful women, dreaming of their loved ones, strumming their guitars, tinkling at their virginals, demand that you note their fragility and breakability as they offer themselves up so sadly for your inspection. These are moods so delicate 
that the lightest knock would shatter them like crystal. A climatic nuance, a shadow, a touch, a gesture. The final meaning of life is conveyed in such subtle ways. In the end, what's being understood here is the fragility of life itself, the vulnerability of beauty, the shortness of youth. And the fact that some, or even most, of Vermeer's girls with pearl earrings were probably the painter's own daughters adds so much poignancy to his message and personalises it so baroquely these are not theoretical understandings that are being passed on to us here. These are understandings born of fatherhood and observation. Vermeer himself was a thoroughly obscure figure, completely forgotten, for 300 years before the 19th century rediscovered him. But this lack of reliable fame seems somehow to supplement the meaning of his pictures. Here today, gone tomorrow. That's the artist's life for you. The golden age of Dutch art spewed out so many fascinating painters. And I'd be happy to spend many months here remembering them for you. But staying put is not Baroque behaviour. This series promised to take you from St Peter's over here to St Paul's over there. And that means we've got some water to cross. We've been watching the Baroque spreading like a wild fire across Europe, Italy, Spain, Holland. So all it needs to finish its journey is to get across here to England. Hmm. Getting to England was no easy journey for the Baroque. Crossing the Channel was difficult enough, but an even sterner barrier was the innate English resistance to emotional and flamboyant art. By the time the Baroque reached here in the 1620s or so, England was, artistically speaking, the most backward of the great European powers. Never mind the Baroque taking its time, even the Renaissance hadn't got here yet. 17th century England was still stuck in the Middle Ages, a half-timbered medieval hotchpotch of higgledy-piggledy Tudor DIY. And as always in these turbulent years, the forces holding back progress were fiercely religious. The events of the Reformation had filled the English with rabid suspicion, not just of popish plots, but of popish art as well. As William Prynne, the Puritan agitator, would later put it, there was no welcome on these shores for the sinful, the idolatrous, the abominable, by which he meant art. Thank you. 
So although the Baroque got here all right, indeed, it did great things here. Look at that, one of the most magnificent Baroque sites anywhere in the world. But it wasn't an uncomplicated arrival, and it had tragic and momentous consequences. Here comes the chopper to chop off your head! This stupendous riverside vista at Greenwich consists of three Baroque firsts. Up on the hill, that charming brick building was the Royal Observatory, begun in 1675, the first purpose-built scientific establishment in the world. The exciting Baroque palace across the front isn't a palace at all, but the first old people's home built to look like a palace. Christopher Wren's Greenwich Hospital, a retirement home for wounded sailors, so successfully posh that the old sea dogs were soon kicked out and their officers moved in. But the key building here is the one in the middle, the dinky little white one, Inigo Jones's Queen's House. It was designed for Anne of Denmark in 1617. Take a good look at it, because that is possibly the most important little building in the whole of British architecture. Although technically it belongs to the Baroque era, what the Queen's House actually constitutes is the first sophisticated bit of European building to be attempted in England. It's the whole of the Renaissance, as well as the Baroque, rolled into one and arriving in England at last. It's white, it's angelic, and it's not half-timbered. Hallelujah! But, let's be honest, it's not an exciting building. Inigo Jones was not an exciting architect. What made him special was the fact that he'd been to Italy, he'd seen what architecture could do, come back to England, and he'd opened the floodgates. The Queen's house is the tiny crack through which the Baroque poured into England. But the man who enlarged that crack and turned it into a giant opening wasn't an artist or an architect, but a king. The British monarchy has a patchy record in matters of art. Aesthetic concerns have hardly ever been a priority. with one superb exception. The only king with taste and the only king whose head we cut off. Charles I was an unlikely candidate to become an artistic savior. A tiny man, just five feet three, he was born with a cluster of disadvantages. He couldn't walk properly or talk till he was three, and he always had a slight stutter. When he was young, his tutors would make him wear iron boots to strengthen his legs, but he became an expert horseman. Who would have suspected, though, that he would also turn into a man of art? In 1623, when he was 23, Charles was packed off to Spain to fulfill the so-called Spanish mission. The hope was that he would marry the daughter of the Spanish king, Philip II, bring peace to Europe and a huge Spanish dowry back to London. The Spanish marriage plans eventually fell through, thank God. If you remember from the last film, the one set in Spain, 
the Spanish Habsburgs had bred themselves into a genetic mess. Cousins had married cousins. Nieces had become wives. And heaven knows what genetic misfortunes would have been visited upon the British monarchy if Charles had married a Habsburg. The other problem was the hugely discombobulating fact that the Spanish princess was a Catholic. After all the religious turmoil that England had just been through, the dissolution of the monasteries, Henry VIII's battles with Rome, the idea of Charles marrying a Spanish Catholic was dismaying, to say the least. But one splendid thing did come out of the failed Spanish mission. In Madrid, Charles was shown around the royal residences, where he discovered Titian, Tintoretto, Raphael, and his eyes were opened to the delights of art. Also in Spain, Charles came into contact with the finest and most successful Baroque painter of these dramatic times, Rubens, the King of Flesh. So although the Spanish marriage didn't work out, Charles came back to England a changed man, a man who was mad about art. And it was to prove his downfall. That's the banqueting house in Whitehall, just up from Big Ben, designed again by Inigo Jones. Originally, as the venue for a huge party that was supposed to follow the Spanish wedding, the one that never happened. The banqueting house was part of a rambling palace that Charles built on the side of the Thames in imitation of the Spanish royals. Most of it was destroyed in 1698, but the banqueting house survives. And inside it is the only painted ceiling by Rubens that's still in place. It's been called the greatest painted ceiling north of the Alps, and it's right under our noses in London. Rubens came here originally on a diplomatic mission sent by the King of Spain, but Charles dug his exquisite royal fingers into him and he commissioned this. It tells of the union of the crowns of Scotland and England under Charles's father, James I and of the good things that resulted. In the central scene, James is going up to heaven. See him there, as peace crowns him with laurel. Over here, Bounty sits on avarice and brings goodness to England, while greed shivers nakedly. Over there, good government tramples on rebellion. It was actually painted in Antwerp in Rubens' studio and then shipped over in bits. Charles liked it so much he knighted Rubens and even gave him a hat worth £500 as a thank you. And also the ring from his own finger. Charles himself appears on the ceiling as a little boy, brought before the king to observe the union of the crowns. When Charles became king in 1625, he would hold court down here. So the union of the crowns would be facing him the right way up. But for the general audience who entered through that door, 
the first thing they would see would be James the first ascending to heaven and being crowned by the gods, thereby affirming the divine right of kings who are answerable only to God. Although it tells the Protestant tale of the making of Great Britain and the union of the crowns, there's a popish air to the banqueting house ceiling. Rubens has turned King James into Saint James, and many would have noticed that. Rubens' great ceiling would have been the last art that Charles saw when, a few short years after it was finished, Parliament decided to punish the king for his extravagances by beheading him. But a lot needed to happen before we reach that tragic conclusion. What matters here is the key role played by art in these events. Charles I was an addict, and his addiction wasn't women or wine or even power. His addiction was art. He would send his agents out into Europe looking for the best pictures. Their instruction was to buy, buy, buy. There were masterpieces here by Mantegna, Raphael, Leonardo. Charles even bought some Caravaggios. That's how progressive he was. Caravaggio's Death of the Virgin, that magnificent display of Catholic mourning that now hangs in the Louvre with its fatally slumped Mary, once hung here in England. It wasn't just as a collector that Charles distinguished himself, it was also as a patron. Having convinced Rubens, the greatest ceiling painter north of the Alps, to work for him, Charles then turned his attention to Rubens's greatest pupil. The arrival in Britain of Anthony van Dyck changed everything here. It ushered in the most dramatic years there have been in English painting. Van Dyck opened the door and the Baroque flooded in. He was a handsome devil, graceful, charming, eloquent, masterfully diplomatic, the perfect courtier. Ladies loved him, and so did kings. Charles pursued Van Dyck furiously for nearly a decade before he finally persuaded this dashing Belgian to come to England in 1632 and become the king's painter. It was like the arrival of a Ferrari at a bicycle race. 
Van Dyck, with his fast hands and exhilarating courtier's touch, seemed to come not just from another country, but from another planet. Suddenly, poise, elegance, excitement, arrogance entered British art. And he made something so heroic out of Charles I. Those who mistrust his work complain of chronic flattery. And I don't think you can deny it. In that stupendous equestrian portrait that still hangs in Buckingham Palace, the little king with the gammy legs has been turned into a heroic knight in armour, riding out on his white steed, Sir Lancelot of Whitehall. Van Dyck worked an even greater transformation on the French princess whom Charles successfully married after his Spanish adventure fell through. Queen Henrietta Maria, a tiny bird-like woman, had teeth which, according to a passing Venetian envoy, stuck out of her face like ship's cannons. Though you'd never know it from any of Van Dyck's gorgeous reimaginings of her. No wonder the king showered him with favours, gave him a house by the river in Blackfriars, knighted him and adored him. Although the king was Van Dyck's main employer, the lesser members of the court were soon fighting over his services as well. If you were a man, who wouldn't wish to be remembered as dashingly as this? If you were a woman, who wouldn't envy this kind of beauty? But he was more than a flatterer. Yes, those dashing cavaliers of his with their nonchalant poses and those perfectly delightful Carolingian temptresses flashing their silks at you. They're easy on the eye. But look into their faces and there's something else there. A note of sadness, a touch of worry, a fragility. Van Dyck was as great a painter as he was because he couldn't keep the times he was living through out of his art. And I don't think he wanted to. And it's this psychological magnetism of his that makes him so Baroque. Van Dyck's dashing and ringleted cavaliers with their superb nonchalance are the perfect pictorial inhabitants of these thoroughly exciting times. Everything about Van Dyck was poised, measured, successful, except the manner of his dying. He was killed by a miserable fever in 1641 and died in that house that Charles gave him in Blackfriars, aged just 42, tragically young. But he'd changed British portraiture forever and he'd put an unforgettable face to his era. To be a truly important artist, you see, it's not enough to be talented. You need also to live through truly important times, and your work needs somehow to embody those times. Now, the fates up there, they know this. Indeed, they plan for it. How else to explain the extraordinary fact that as soon as Van Dyck was dead, the English Civil War broke out? Everything changed, and out of nowhere, it seems, he appeared on the scene. If you read conventional books about British art, they'll tell you that the first native genius born on these shores was William Hogarth. But that's not true. The first British-born genius, the first truly dazzling English painter, was born a hundred years before Hogarth. He's that 
handsome fellow in the middle, whose name you probably won't know, even though it's a fine English name. William Dobson. Fate dropped Dobson slap in the middle of one of the most tumultuous, dramatic and tragic epochs in Britain's recorded history, the English Civil War. And if Dobson hadn't been there and put a face to his era, the truth about these dramatic times would have gone unrecorded. Fate gave Dobson this magnificent moment all to himself, and God made sure he was talented enough to record it, unforgettably and brilliantly. When the Civil War broke out in 1642, just a few short weeks after Van Dyke's death, the King and his court decamped from London to Oxford. And for the next four years, this was to be their home. All Souls became the Royalist Arsenal. Magdalen College was where the artillery was parked. The music school was taken over by tailors making new uniforms for the king's men. The queen lived here in Merton College. The king himself moved into Christchurch College and the quad was used as a cattle pen for the soldiers. Later on, Christopher Wren designed the famous tower. Poor little Oxford didn't know what had hit it. The town was overrun with courtiers, soldiers, freeloaders. Drunken cavaliers wandered the streets, getting into fights. And their bravado in their eyes, their courageous excitement, was vividly captured by William Dobson. The king, who always prized his own aesthetic comforts, set up a travelling court for himself here in Oxford. And this man, Nicholas Lanier, was master of the king's music. Now study his face well, because he also appears in that exciting self-portrait we've just been looking at by Dobson. Dobson was made the king's official painter, and he kept himself very busy painting the various notables who popped up in Oxford. This is Dobson's rather shaky portrait of Inigo Jones. And here's his magnificent Charles II, the boy who would be king, subduing the Furies, with a commanding royal gesture as the Battle of Edge Hill rages in the distance. It's a magnificent piece of royal portraiture, and it's so thoroughly English. Dobson must have worked about the court before the Civil War started, but there's no record of it. It's as if he emerged from nowhere. He obviously knew Van Dyck's work well, and he was just as obviously his own man, who brought a stubborn, four-square beefiness to British portraiture. Those who sat for him seemed often to put on a stone and a half in his presence. He made them bulkier, earthier. Here's Endymion Porter, painted by Van Dyck, and here he is by Dobson. Here's Nicholas Lanier, as Van Dyck saw him. Here's how he saw himself. And here is what Dobson made of him. Inside every Englishman, it seems, there's a Henry VIII waiting to be discovered. It's such lively portraiture. I can't believe Dobson is so obscure. We should applaud him from every historical rafter in England. He was there in the Civil War. He gave it a face. 
And history thanked him by forgetting him completely and by making sure he suffered the grubbiest of deaths. He died in London in 1646, an alcoholic, they say, penniless, in debt, dumped into an almshouse, aged just 36. The only paintings we know by him were all done in those few short years in Oxford before the war was lost. That was his moment, and how vigorously he seized it. After Dobson's death, the king plotted on for a few more years, but the fates were determined to punish him for his aesthetic extravagances and arranged an outrageously dramatic finale for him. It all came to a terrible end on January the 30th, 1649. The king was executed outside the very banqueting house that had ushered in his Baroque age. They put up a special scaffold up there. It was an unusually cold day, so the king wore an extra shirt so that no one would mistake his shivering for fear. By all accounts, he went to his scaffold with great dignity. A king ruined, in part at least, by his Baroque obsession with art. Cromwell and the Puritans quickly set about selling off the royal collection. The royal plumber was given a painting of Noah's flood by Bassano, some sort of weak Cromwellian joke, I suppose. And the hated French and Spanish courts bought up all the Titians and the Caravaggios, and they're now found in the Louvre and the Prado. So the story of painting in England more or less ground to a halt, and it was time for another of the great Baroque arts to step up and be counted. It was time for architecture, with a little unexpected help from the hand of God. The Great Fire of London in the Devil's Year of 1666 is one of the mythic turning points in the story of the Baroque. The fire started in a baker's shop here in Pudding Lane, run by the King's personal baker. And this baker's shop was situated here, far away from the King's palaces, as a deliberate safety measure to make sure that no fires were started in Whitehall. So instead, the Royal Bakery ended up setting fire to the whole of London. For three whole days it raged. Two thirds of the metropolis was destroyed. For Londoners, it was a colossal tragedy. For the Baroque, it was a godsend. What the Great Fire accidentally achieved was the purging of Tudor London. Street after street of highly inflammable, half-timbered housing was torched, creating a golden building opportunity for the English Baroque. And, as sometimes happens in Britain in times of deep national need, a great hero stepped forward to save the day. Christopher Wren didn't look like an architectural warrior. But then, in these ornate Baroque times, everyone's seriousness was compromised by absurd restoration wigs and powdery facial get-ups. The fascinating thing about Wren is that he already had a big career behind him as a scientist before he turned to architecture. He was Professor of Astronomy at Oxford, where he made important discoveries in telescope techniques and motion studies. And Wren was the first man successfully to introduce a foreign substance into the bloodstream of a dog, thereby inventing the injection. Inside that huge Baroque brain of his, 
Wren was constantly making amazing scientific connections. But how these led him to architecture, God only knows. The fire had destroyed 87 London churches. 87! No wonder it must have seemed like an act of God. And when Wren stepped forward to rebuild 51 of them, yes, 51, he was driven by something more than mere dutifulness. Because beneath that powdery restoration disguise of his, Sir Christopher Wren saw himself so baroquely as an instrument of God. This square mile of the City of London contains the finest concentration of Baroque architecture outside Rome. 51 Baroque gems nestling among the money-making skyscrapers. Now, obviously, I can't show all of those to you at once, but let's see how many a fat lump like me can get round to see in 15 minutes. His finest creative energy went into the steeples. The English liked their steeples, Wren knew that, but rather than giving them pointy bits of Gothic that they were used to, Wren came up with things like that. St. Brides, you know, the modern wedding cake with all the different layers. That was inspired by this steeple. Get it? St. Brides. St. Mary Le Beau. To be a proper cockney, you need to have been born within earshot of that fantastical steeple. I like this one, St. Vedast. The way it curves and bulges baroquely in and out. Wren had to invent a new kind of church, an Anglican church. Before, the Church of England had been happy to convert Catholic churches, but he had to come up with something new from scratch. The interiors also needed complete reinvention. This is St. Margaret's Lothbury, the best surviving Wren interior. A bold rectangle with these big wide windows and an air of elegant simplicity. The Protestant interior. Five churches, 15 minutes. A fitter man than me we we'll probably have got around 10. And of course, all the time that Wren was building the London churches, his greatest achievement, St. Paul's Cathedral, was rising up out of the ashes of the Great Fire. St. Paul's took 35 years to finish. And while we're waiting for that to happen, we should get out of London, expand our horizons, because the Baroque was much too powerful an epidemic to confine itself to the city. The English stately home was one of the most distinctive and delightful inventions of the Baroque age. Of course, other nations dotted their countryside with big houses too. But no one else was quite as keen as the British to position excellent architecture in an excellent stretch of landscape. When you look at somewhere magnificently English, like Blenheim Palace, you're looking at an outdoor composition in which everything has been placed just so. It's a duet, if you like, between the house and its landscape. And that sense you get here of the whole thing being one entity. No one else did that. That is a fine invention of the English Baroque.
But the closer you get to Blenheim Palace, the less rural and relaxed it begins to seem. Because Blenheim is the greatest and grandest creation of the full-blown English Baroque. The house itself is the handiwork of that fascinating and busy Baroque bee, Sir John Vanborough. When you look at portraits of Vanborough, it's difficult to take the man seriously. He had the biggest of big hairdos and a puffy, pouty look to him with his velvets and his lace. But underneath this powdered and billowing Baroque exterior lurked one of the most interesting creative minds that these times produced. Vanbra looked like a toff and he built like a toff, but he actually had fierce democratic leanings. So much so that in 1688 he was imprisoned in the Bastille for seditious and revolutionary behaviour and espionage. He spent four and a half years in that French jail and when he came out he became a playwright and he wrote that marvellous restoration comedy, The Provoked Wife, which is probably playing at an Amdram somewhere near you right now. He wrote poems, pamphlets, plays, and managed somehow to become an architect too, and a very quirky one. Blenheim is the largest and most bombastic of Britain's country houses. The only one allowed to call itself a palace. It was built to celebrate the Duke of Marlborough's famous victory over the French at the Battle of Blenheim. So pleased was the British monarchy with the Duke's great victory that they gave him this land and told him to build something suitable on it. So it was always meant to be more of a war memorial than a home. And that's why there is this heavyweight grandeur and seriousness to it. Other English country houses settle gently on the landscape like a butterfly. But Blenheim needed to land heavily like a great big ceremonial cake. And you have to admit, it does that impeccably. Vanborough's ambition here is to find a Baroque architecture that resounds with power and might. Go round the back and it all gets a little more relaxed and playful. A nice backdrop for the occasional game of cricket. But that's the back. At the front, this is a building that demands your obedience and respect. The era's finest sculptor, Grinling Gibbons, was employed to carve these giant English lions, chewing up the pathetic French cock. And at the top of the house, where no one could miss him, Vanborough placed a giant captured bust of the defeated Sun King, Louis XIV, so that visitors could mock him as they entered the house. While the outside of Blenheim puffs out its chest and demands your obedience, the inside puffs out its chest and demands that you dress properly for dinner. That great English warrior, Sir Winston Churchill, was born at Blenheim, of course. And some of its military mood was his inheritance. Visitors entered into here where they'd be overwhelmed by all this mighty Baroque architecture with its militaristic air. Then they'd be led through here underneath the minstrel gallery into Blenheim's great saloon, its most surprising sight. An illusionistic courtyard that turns the inside of Blenheim into an outside. It's 
It was painted by the aptly named Louis Laguerre, a French painter whose name means, in translation, Louis the War. There he is up there, too prim and powdered, you would have thought, to be much of a painter. Laguerre came up with an illusionistic ring of balconies on which has gathered a pretend audience of international visitors to Blenheim from the four corners of the earth, from France, from Spain, from China, and from wherever that is. They're here to watch the room's central scene in which the mighty Duke of Marlborough rushes across the sky in his chariot like a Marvel comic hero, while the embodiment of peace stays his militaristic arm and persuades him to stop fighting. It's a decent bit of Baroque hack work and it does its job well enough, faking up some grandeur and illusionism for these stately rooms and throwing in some handy propaganda for peace. But at this point in the Baroque story, and we're very near the tail end, these illusionistic ambitions are outweighing the meaningful content. And the Baroque has grown slightly silly. That's inside the fake interior of Blenheim, and it's not something you could ever say of the palace's exterior. Blenheim on the outside is a masterclass of Baroque invention. These weird towers, for instance, how strange and unexpected are they? Or this peculiar cluster of bold architectural sculpture. Who on earth came up with this? Vanbrugh came late to architecture. He was basically an amateur, so he needed some professional help to achieve all this. And while the grandeur and the bombast that you see here is definitely Vanbrugh's handiwork, much of the architectural brilliance is due to someone else. Vanbrugh's number two at Blenheim, the designer of many of the best bits, was this lopsided Borromini of Blenheim, Nicholas Hawksmore. Hawksmore was the most inventive and madcap architect these shores have produced. If things look excitingly strange in British Baroque architecture, the chances are Hawksmore did it. And according to some, scattering bits of eccentric Baroque around London wasn't all that Hawksmoor did. <laughs> Hawksmoor, a time-travelling murder mystery by Peter Ackroyd. Lud Heat, a collection of weird existential poems about Hawksmoor by Ian Sinclair. And From Hell, an extra-large gothic horror comic set in Hawksmoor's London and all about the Ripper murders by Alan Moore and Eddie Campbell. All of these excessively fruity tomes accuse Britain's most mysterious Baroque builder of being the architect not just of buildings but also of evil. Mind you, wandering around the churchyard of a Hawksmoor building at twilight in the autumn is a distinctly spooky experience. His buildings definitely have a psychological presence. It's the Baroque getting inside your head again. In 1711, the British Parliament passed some new legislation providing tax money to build 50 new London churches. In the end, only a dozen of them were finished, six of them by Hawksmoor. He also designed the towers of two of the other ones. And these London churches 
are Hawksmoor's most important Baroque achievements. Now I've marked out their positions on this London map. So over here is St George Bloomsbury. That's the one with the strange ziggurat for a steeple and the statue of George I on the top. Very peculiar building. And over here is Christchurch Spitalfields. Now it's around this church that all the Ripper murders were supposed to have taken place. It's the one with the pointy Gothic steeple. Now out here is St Anne's Limehouse. This one here with the strange obelisk in front of it. In the centre of the city, right in the centre, St Mary Woolnoth, very peculiar looking building. And over here, St George in the East, the one with a Spanish look to it. Now Hawksmoor also designed these two towers, not the whole church, but the two towers for other people's churches. There's St Luke's Old Street, which is over here, and St John's Horsley Down, that was down here, south of the river. Now, according to this book here, Ludheat, Ian Sinclair, if you join up these Hawksmoor churches with their positions here, what you get is a diagram that bears an uncanny resemblance to an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph. Down here, the last of the Hawksmoor churches, St Alphage, Greenwich, the one with the huge keystones. And that's the final bit of the jigsaw which makes this mysterious symbol the Eye of Horus, protector of all deities, safeguarder of the deepest secrets. And this mad idea that Hawksmoor deliberately planned the position of his churches so that they formed this mysterious ancient diagram reaches its crescendo in this great big comic book where Jack the Ripper's murders and the secrets of the Freemasons and the position of Hawksmoor's churches and all manner of weird hocus pocus that I can't begin to understand is mixed together in a mysterious Baroque soup. Of course it's all nonsense, really silly, but what isn't nonsense is the atmosphere of Hawksmoor's work, which is, take it from me, doomy and unsettling. Someone once wrote that you can imagine funerals taking place in a Hawksmoor church, but not weddings. How true that is. These looming, oversized and madly inventive slabs of architectural sampling are some of the strangest concoctions the Baroque ever came up with. What is that on top of St George's Bloomsbury? And who ever saw a ziggurattic pyramid atop an Anglican church? In Hawksmoor, the English Baroque grows very eccentric. His architecture mixes things that have never been mixed before. Mexican, Gothic, Greek, Egyptian. And it's the very unexpectedness of this mix that makes it unmistakably Baroque. Do I like it? Hmm, not always. Do I recognise genius in here? Of course. Is it the greatest achievement of the English Baroque? No. But that's only because this is. Do you know how many great cathedrals there are in the world that were actually built in the lifetimes of their architect? One, this one, St Paul's. Wren designed it, he watched the first stone going down, he watched the last stone going down. From 1675 
1710. 35 years. What an achievement. There was a biblical air to the great fire that destroyed the old St. Paul's. The sense that God had played a deliberate part in the purging of London must have seemed inescapable. From the start, Wren wanted to build an imposing domed cathedral here. A great church roundel to rank alongside St. Peter's in Rome. And he achieved that, of course. But it took a momentous piece of deception. This is the giant model Wren made of St. Paul's as he dreamt of building it. This is what he really wanted to do here. But the English clergy found Wren's domed basilica too Catholic and popish and rejected his splendid design. He was forced to come up with something else, something more English, more traditional. So he proposed instead this grim compromise. A bit of a steeple, a bit of a nave, a bit of a mess. And when the scaffolds went up in 1675 for the new St Paul's, this is what people were expecting to be built. 35 years later, however, when the scaffolds finally came down, look what the English Baroque had actually come up with. Wren had lied through his teeth about what he was going to build. He promised us this, and all the time he was building this. St Paul's was never what it seems to be. These high palatial walls, for instance, rising grandly above the city, are actually false and unnecessary. They're just there for effect. See, so the actual building from the front took off the facade would be shaped like this with a nave, two aisles down either side. But what Wren's done is he's put up these false walls. They're just there for show to make the building look much higher from the side. So in between here, there are empty spaces. And the dome, that too, is illusionistic. It's actually not one dome, but three. Out here, you have the big dome that everybody sees. Inside, there's another dome that you only see on the inside. And then there's one that you don't see at all, which is a kind of conical dome that goes up the middle and that supports the lantern. So what you see on the outside is completely different from what you see on the inside. So Wren got his popish cathedral in the end. He promised us an ugly English compromise. Instead, he connived to bring us a soaring ecclesiastical masterpiece that wouldn't look too out of place in Rome itself. And that's the thing about the English Baroque. On paper, it's thoroughly Protestant. In the flesh, it's not so sure. We began this series in Rome, in front of St. Peter's. And I told you that we'd follow the Baroque from Rome to London, from St. Peter's to St. Paul's. Now, here we are at the end of the journey, and we've watched the Baroque squiggling its way through the entire 17th century, always 
pushing, expanding, changing. We've seen the Baroque grow thunderous and huge as it sought to batter us into submission. And we've watched it go plaintive and sad as it tried to get inside our minds and our hearts. We've watched it rope in all the other arts for support, sculpture, architecture. This way and that it billowed through enormous spaces and tiny ones. If you remember, I told you that the actual word Baroque comes from this, a misshapen pearl, Barocco in Portuguese. And if you are expecting this series to follow a straight line, you'll be disappointed because the Baroque didn't do straight lines. But there is something that unites all these magnificent sights and spectacles and makes them typically Baroque. Something powerful that brings everything together. It's the need to be noticed. The Baroque built big because big things have a big impact. It dazzled you with its illusions and caught you up in its psychology because it wanted your time and your attention. It was the first art movement to realise that being good wasn't enough. You needed also to make an impact. It's a lesson the arts have never forgotten. If you want an audience, get out there and grab it.